Don Cusick with the Music Biz, and today my guest is Kip Kirby, who is the Nashville editor of Billboard magazine. Kip, let me begin by asking, how did you get started in the music industry? In a very roundabout way. Um, I actually didn't come into it from a college degree or years of freelance writing and journalistic experience, Don. Actually, I came into it via bartending. I was working at a club called The Exit Inn, which was a, at that time a major national uh, showcase club and uh, record companies would bring people in like Linda Ronstadt and Steve Martin and you know we had jazz and country and rock and so forth and I would go in early and I'd hang around the sound checks and I'd get to know the acts and I started learning about the way they worked with audiences and we talked about tours and what was working and what wasn't and I started doing freelance writing at that time for a couple of Nashville publications and eventually the club was sold I um, escalated into the position of publicity director and one day I heard there was a staff reporting position open at Billboard magazine so with uh, no trepidation uh, great courage and nothing to lose I applied for the job and more or less talked my way into it you you worked at another trade for a little while didn't you at Record World uh, very briefly um, I filled in doing a lot of temporary things yeah. I mean I was literally a jack-of-all-trades around Nashville yeah. and who so, was the editor of Record World at the time uh, well, you were there. Oh, thanks for mentioning oh, that. Oh, I see what we're leading into. <laughs> All right, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now what is a trade? A trade is a publication designed to educate people in a particular field about ways that they can make money or um, increase their, their business uh, in, in that particular field. Okay. Uh, Billboard's an international trade, as you know. We reach over 100 countries around the world, and our subscription or circulation is uh, about 43,000 a week. And, and who reads Billboard? Billboard is a horizontal publication, which means that instead of appealing to one segment of the entertainment business, i.e. radio mm -hmm. or video, we appeal to anyone connected with uh, the music business. That could be A&R people at labels, it could be producers, it could be artists, it could be um, talent agents or bookers. We also cover computer software, we cover recording studios, video companies, uh, video production, record production, pressing, um, international news. So we appeal to anybody who is involved in any peripheral way with the entertainment industry. When you say international, you have uh, subscribers all over the world? Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and we even people... have correspondence in places like Moscow. Every now and then there'll be a Moscow or a <laughs> Beirut dateline. Yeah. Hey, so and, and the people that read it are the ones actively involved in the music industry? For the most part. We do have um, you know, fans who, who will pick mm -hmm. up Billboard just to stay uh, current with the charts or find out what's going on. How many, with how it. many people read it uh, a week? Well, our circulation is, is clocked in at over 43,000. Most of that is paid subscribers. We have some newsstand sales. Mm -hmm. Now, the, w within the record industry, and I'm talking about New York, LA, and Nashville, everybody says the trades are so important. Why are they important? The trades are important because in certain ways they dictate what is happening, what is going to happen, and how it's happening. We are ideally supposed to reflect what is going on in the industry. We are supposed to tell you how um, trends in the industry will affect your business, how you can make money, give you ideas of how other people doing what you're doing are, are surviving and becoming successful. But uh, because a magazine like Billboard has charts, which you know uh, reflect the status of records as they go up and because in a lot of ways we're reflecting opinions of the movers and shakers in the industry it's almost a which comes first the chicken or the egg type of uh, situation mm -hmm. now you mentioned charts what are charts explain those trade charts are uh, listings each week that show where designated records are in terms of airplay and or sales across the country uh, or in the world. Um, I'll talk about the U.S. just for purposes of this conversation. Uh, there are charts for adult contemporary records, the Hot 100, which is top 40. We have country charts. We have video cassette charts now. We have uh, um, 
um, there's so many charts in Billboard, and they're expanding them all the time, black music charts, but video are new charts, and we also do uh, computer software and entertainment uh, software. And how are they compiled? How, how is the country chart compiled or the pop chart? Briefly, I know you don't do charts, but right. briefly tell me how they're compiled. Well, there are radio stations that report to Billboard. There are stores that report to Billboard, retail stores. Mm -hmm. So let's take records, for instance. Let's take country records, since that's what I deal with mostly. Um, there are 130 radio stations uh, in the United States who report to Billboard with country playlists telling us each week what they are playing in high rotation, you know, say their top ten, mm -hmm. where records are in rotation. We list a hundred records a week. We also do albums. Uh, the information that comes in from the radio stations is put together with sales reports on how the singles and albums are doing at retail and then they're given a certain point value and uh, this is a computerized process mm -hmm. and then they're hand positioned and that's how it works and ones that are particularly prime movers for the week have bullets. And so th th what the charts tell people is which records are doing best out there in... That is the ideal nature of the charts. They are supposed to tell you what uh, the records are doing. Well, let me get back to the point you made about going from reflecting to dictating. Uh, isn't it true that a lot of people, radio stations, just look at the charts and say, aha, this is number one on Billboard's charts, I'm going to make it number one at my station, on down the line, and if it's not on the charts, they don't play it. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the main problem that we're having right now with the chart system altogether. Um, radio stations are supposed to use the charts only as a median guide to see what other people are doing and how the records are, are stacking up. They are not supposed to be programming guides. And when radio station programmers use our charts to program their radio stations and then turn around and feed us that information back as how the records are doing in their market, it's an inbred situation that totally uh, convolutes the reality. How could you solve that? The only way it can be solved, I believe, is if radio programmers will stop using the charts in that manner. If they will simply look at the charts as a way of gauging the success of records overall, but not using them to dictate what gets played in their market. Mm -hmm. I would like to see the charts devalued in terms of their programming status. Well, but if they're devalued, then, then the essence of Billboard is devalued, isn't it? Isn't that the essence of the trades, the charts? Well, I think if the charts are accurate, people will always respect them. Mm -hmm. The problem is when, as I think the issue is right now in the industry, when you've got a period where people believe that the charts are not reflecting accuracy, that they're um, convoluted to a point where the information that's coming back to us is actually the information that we're feeding out to the programmers, mm -hmm. if you understand what I'm saying, then people begin to doubt the veracity of the charts, and that's unhealthy. Mm -hmm. There's been a question about whether uh, the independent promotion people or promotion people are controlling the charts via controlling radio airplay. And we all know that with like the Gallup poll and political polls, uh, one of the keys to an accurate forecast is a random database. You have a fixed database. You have 120 radio stations. Well, it, it changes, that but it's 130, to you, I think, 130 right radio stations. How about going to a random database, eliminating all the promotion people and just calling 130 randomly? Has that been considered? or? Well, the stores, uh, the radio stations are, are known. The reporting panel for radio stations are known. For some reason, the sales uh, panel is not supposed to be publicly available and they are rotated. We're the only trade that does use sales. Mm -hmm. um, the other two trades, you know, use airplay only. Uh, we I use, thought Cashbox used sales. Maybe they do on uh, on the album charts. Well, on albums, but on singles? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what they're using right now, but um, with us, we, we feel that it's a fair way to gauge. That way, if a record's doing very well in sales and not so well with airplay, which is unusual, but can mm -hmm. happen, uh, that way it's got a shot both ways. We want it to be a real record. But I don't know. I, I think that if people would understand that the charts can be valuable tools if used properly, uh, I'd like to see the promotion game eliminated. I don't mean that promotion people aren't valuable, but I do think they should not influence as strongly as they do what gets played on radio stations around the country. There's always the criticism from promotion people and from record labels that uh, there's something wrong with the charts. Basically what they're saying is, my record's not doing as well as I think it should be doing. Mm -hmm. But is a large part of your job answering the criticism about the charts? No, uh, my job is editorial. And mm -hmm. fortunately, whenever we get into issues of advertising or charts, I have people that I refer the questions to. 
uh, what I tell people is, wouldn't it be neat if the real name of the game in programming was listening to the records? Wouldn't it be neat if people didn't use what has a bullet, what loses a bullet as their criteria for adding or dropping a record? Wouldn't it be great if a record with real merit, unknown artist, unknown label, whatever, wouldn't it be neat if that's what got played? Mm -hmm. But when you've got a, a situation as locked in as it is right now with the major labels and the promotion situation, and programmers playing along with that situation, um, again, I, I don't think that's healthy. But aren't we in a research-dominated society? We're always gathering research, mm -hmm. and the charts are one more uh, tool of research. I wonder about research. the research. I wonder, because when I speak to college classes, when I talk to people who are not in the industry, mm -hmm. what they tell me over and over is, how come radio is so boring? How come I hear the same records over and over, no matter what station I punch? And I tell them it's because of all the things we're talking about right now. Nobody's going to go out on a limb and take a chance on breaking new records the way they used to when the name of the game is bottom line, when radio stations have enormous advertising budgets they have to meet. Uh, or have to bring in mm -hmm. overhead general managers who are sitting there with the charts each week saying, well, let's see, uh, you're not playing what Billboard's reporting as the top 30. Uh, you know, d what's the matter? Don't you want your job? Is, is that why people aren't programming kind of what they like? That's not what radio says. Radio says that uh, everything is fine and research shows and our listeners are happy and if we play that and it's not right for the market, all our listeners will go away and we can't afford to lose three quarters of a point because it's, you know, X number of hundreds of thousands of dollars of advertising. But I just wonder. I miss the excitement of radio. I miss the fascination with the new product. I, I don't hear any of that right now. I think radio is very boring, and I'm very sad about that. Well, but is it boring because maybe it's part, it's passe, it's part of the past? No, uh, I don't think radio is part of the past. I think radio has a slot that isn't met by anything else. I mean, number one in the car, there is nothing that can touch radio in the car. And if anyone says television, I sure hope they're not driving along. I oh, but cassette players do. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think that if, if the music on radio were as exciting as what you can flip into your tape deck by buying some unusual new cassette, then we might find people experimenting more. Why should all the stations sound the same? Why should a station in Dubuque, Iowa sound the same as one in Bangor, Maine? Mm -hmm. You know, why can't I hear more regional music? Why can't I hear differences of uh, uh, programming format? Don't you think that reflects the national uh, character? We all want to be national? Maybe. The per what, what the guy's wearing in Seattle the, is the same thing that the Maybe. guy's wearing in Orlando? Maybe, but you know, I grew up in the 60s and I remember the excitement then of make it or break it hours. I remember John R. breaking records and, you know, Wolfman Jack when he had his radio station over the border. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember those days and radio was exciting then. Maybe it isn't possible. Maybe people will not ever be that involved with radio again. Again, but it sure would be neat if someone tried. Getting back to the trades, you just ran a story not too long ago that said something to the effect of, okay, country music is getting played a lot all over the airwaves, but nobody's buying it. What were some of the conclusions you came out of that, that, that came out of that? Or, or were there any conclusions to come out of that? Well, certain undeniable realities. Number one, Top 40 is incredibly exciting right now with the acts that are, are being played on um, you know, Top 40 and mm -hmm. contemporary hit radio stations, Cindy Lauper's and Prince's and Madonna's. It's such an unusual kind of music and there's such an energy right now that we lost in country a lot of the people that are the trendies, the ones that jump over onto the urban cowboy bandwagon and then they jump back onto another kind of music and they'll jump over to black dance music for a while and whatever's hip and trendy they'll follow. The core audience of country is still there. I think some of them were alienated a bit by the media attention and the um, new found crossover aspects and they may have felt their music was diluted. But I think that some of the conclusions that were drawn uh, were the music is not as exciting as it could be. A lot of it is formulaic. Uh, people are not going to pay $8.98 for an album and get two or three cuts that are good. Uh, part of the problem is exposure. Some of the new and exciting acts are having trouble finding a spot at radio because playlists are cut back now to between 25 and 35 records. So if there are 25 or 35 certified country superstars shipping product as soon as their last record is over, you get a situation where there's not much room. Um, Radio and record companies have to open more of a dialogue, and I think they have to work more closely together. It's inevitable that there'll be a cyclical swing, mm -hmm. and we are seeing that. Now, you mentioned trends, and you have one of your jobs, 
with Billboard is to spot trends and write, write about them. And that's what Billboard wants you to do, right? right. Know all the trends of the music industry right. and report this. Right. Uh, maybe it's just a trend. Maybe, mm -hmm. we, maybe we're on the downside of something. Have, have, you, have you seen these kinds of trends emerge before? Yeah, yeah. Well, you're right. Absolutely, it's a trend. We're going to lose a certain amount of audience. There's no way around it. We were hot stuff for three years that we never expected to have. You know, 1980 was a real good year. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we lived off of that for two or three years at that time. But at that time, you found Johnny Lee and Crystal Gale and Anne Murray. I mean, you found many, many artists on the pop charts, on the adult contemporary charts, and on the country charts. That gave them three different charts for airplay. All those people they could reach that they'd never reached before. Therefore, all those sales, which translated into you know, dollars at the uh, mm -hmm. cash register. But the cost of making albums are so much higher now in Nashville. You, you mentioned that, that the music is boring and, and, and radio is, has gotten boring, and I, I won't argue with that, but let me ask you something. How long have you been at Billboard? I'm going into my seventh year. Don't you think there's a, 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 a trend on people who are with trades to develop little thicker skins and maybe get bored a little easier because they're exposed to so much music? I worry about that. Are I don't you part want of the be... problem here? I would never answer that in terms of myself. I try to let the feedback that I get from people outside the industry you know, also mm -hmm. influence me. In the last two weeks, I reviewed about 20 albums and seriously wondered if my ears had become jaded or jaundiced, or was this, in many cases, country schlock? You know, middle of the road, fence sitting, ballads about love and my heart and uh, strings. But love's all over the, the common place. theme. I mean, you, you're either yeah. getting it, keeping it, or losing it. Then. Yeah, but I, I think that when you get a record like It Turns Me Inside Out or Holding Her and Loving You, you can hear a great record. Not mm -hmm. every record can be great, but they should be at least a little bit different. But when you get 40 or 50 in a row that all begin to sound the same, is that us? Mm -hmm. is, is that not why perhaps people aren't rushing out to buy the latest album? And some acts are still selling. Acts that are not falling into that pattern uh, are selling. Gary Morris and the Judds and you know, the superstars mm -hmm. like Alabama and Willie Nelson and Kenny Rogers is, is still selling, you know, even though he's kind of crossed over in the other you, direction. You said radio were followers and they weren't being very exciting and adventuresome. Is, is that the case of the music industry too? The labels and the producers and all those folks, are they just being followed? Are they following the charts too? They're following the charts. Uh, certainly they don't want to take a chance on bringing out something that's... I think pop is much more experimental. Mm -hmm. uh, I need to separate this. In pop, anything goes. You don't have to stand in line, pay your dues, and work up the charts for two or three years to be accepted. Uh, pop programmers don't care. They're not obsessive or possessive about their artists. If you cut a great pop record and they like it, they'll go on it and they'll play it you know, with some money behind mm -hmm. it for promotion. In country, they want to make sure that you're not uh, coming in from the pop side because you couldn't make it in pop. They want to make sure that you're not going to use them for a year or two and then jump off onto the other side. They want to make sure they have all these ramifications that they want to make sure, uh, you know, mm -hmm. fit into place before they consider you a country artist. Okay, getting back to defining the trades, besides billboard, what, what other trades are there? R&R &R and Cashbox. Radio and Records and right. Cashbox. Now, the people who read them uh, don't buy records. Is that, is that generally correct? If they're part of the industry, they, they're not buying records? Oh, well, I think a lot of them are buying records. Uh, there are some labels I don't get product from, and mm -hmm. uh, I buy those records. Well, my, my question being, if you're reaching, uh, if you're just reaching the record industry, and the record industry is not a major buying audience, why are the trades so important? Why would people run advertisements in there? Why would people want to be in the trades? Well, let's say you have a, um, let's say you're a concert promoter. Mm -hmm. You need to know what acts are selling on the road. You need to know what kinds of ticket prices you can get by with. You need to know about problems that tours are having on the road. You need to know how uh, acts records are doing that you may be considering booking. You need to know uh, the kinds of uh, promotions that seem to be working at radio stations that you may be able to tie into your uh, concert in a particular market. There are a lot of ways that you can take the information. You may even need to know that there's a video out there so that you can think about doing some television advertising when that act comes into your market. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of ways you can use the trades to make money, and I don't think whether or not you buy records is, is really relevant to how you use the information in the trades. Okay. What is the role of the trade to the industry? Are you, are you part of the industry or are you an adversary? That depends on who you ask. Um, 
Well, there, I'm asking you. All right. Uh, asking me, I believe that we are part of the industry, but that we also are an objective watchdog. We are supposed to report what is going on, not varnish the truth, not obscure facts, not say, uh, isn't it too bad, and gloss over problem areas. If there are serious problem areas, we report them hopefully within the context of saying, but here is how people are dealing with these problems. Here are some of the strategies they're using to solve the problems. Do you run any negative stories? Yeah. Aren't you biting the hand that feeds you if you do that? Again, if you tie it, when I ran the story on the record sales that you're talking about, the numbers were not pretty. Mm -hmm. They were very unattractive. They were frightening. However, what we've done is develop that into a series in which we're asking retailers, publishers, record companies, radio stations, how are they getting around this situation? Yes, sales are down in country music, but how are, they, how are they working around these areas? What are they doing to turn the situation around? And so we're not really biting the hand that feeds us when we're reporting news, when mm -hmm. we're exploring things in the name of accuracy, but we're trying to use the information to you know, further provide people with uh, ways around bad situations. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you run a story that's, uh, that's, that's negative or when certain records don't do as well on the charts as they some labels think they should a uh, big label do they ever complain do they ever absolutely start they stomping pull, pull advertising that's their favorite thing to do uh -huh. we didn't like that story you ran there goes our advertising uh, I don't know what the longest period of time any record company stayed away from billboard I I'm not sure it seems to me somewhere in the past I heard six months mm -hmm. but there have been at times boycotts against uh, trades and you know uh, certain stories will raise the ire of a record company and they'll scratch their ads for a while but they eventually come back because the advertising is valuable for what they're mm -hmm. trying to do and why should they hurt their acts. So what do you do when they pull the advertising and you say Continue that reporting the news. Even if uh, say an RCA or a CBS or an MCA pulls their ads you just say that's okay if there's news we're going to still report it? Well you try to explain to them that we're not trying to quote bite the hand that feeds uh -huh. us. What we're trying to do is report the facts but also deal with them in a positive way. We don't just throw out a negative story and leave it. Uh, we will explain negativity if that's what the situation is, but we'll try to bring in solutions along with it. How effective is it when they pull their advertising? Does, does your headquarters get nervous and call and say, listen, you've got to do something? They've never done that with me. I, I've had a situation very recently where a record company was very upset about something that was run um, and, and pulled advertising. But the magazine has always believed that uh, editorial integrity was critical and vital and that if we are reporting facts, if we have uh, covered everything in depth and made sure that what we report is the truth, they, they've always stood behind us. And I believe that's the job of a trade. Mm -hmm. Do you, you have a lot of pressure each week of people bringing you press releases, trying to get into the trades, trying to get stories run on them, or, or do you mm -hmm. isolate yourself from that? Well, I try to have a lot of contact with people. We get a lot of information across the desk. Mm -hmm. I mean, coming in through the mail and, yeah. and people bringing press releases yeah. by. What, what, is your, what do your bosses want out of you each week? Give us a story. Give us, give us a trend. Get, you know, there can't be a trend every week. No. But, I mean, what, what do you have to come up with every week? Well, we're expected. I'm responsible for the country section, which is basically eight to ten columns mm -hmm. a week, which have to be filled. So Monday is survival day. That's the day we sit down and figure out what we're going to run. There's always a lead story for the section. Uh, there's always a column that I do called Nashville Scene, which is kind mm -hmm. of a, a gossip column about who's doing what in the country business. Then there's always uh, fillers and shorts and pictures that uh, are put into the magazine. But we also try to write for other parts of the book. The series I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier is a page one series, and that requires work all the way through Thursday with phone conversations and interviews and so forth to get those stories ready. We do talent reviews. Uh, we go to concerts and showcases. Um, we write stories for other people's sections, you know, for publishing mm -hmm. and video. Give, and give me a typical week. Monday you sit down and decide what's Okay, what's Monday, going to be. Uh, Monday I sit down and we try to decide what stories are going to go in. Uh, maybe I've wanted to interview Nicolette Larson that week, mm -hmm. so we try to set the interview up. We figure out who's going to do the lead story and what it will be. Uh, we try to figure out a couple more stories that you can't always depend on, you know, one to carry you through. Tuesday is the day everything has to be filed. It's also the day that we have to file our country album reviews. So we try to listen to them through the week so mm -hmm. we're ready by Tuesday to file. Wednesday is the day we review all the country singles. At one time, I think we were getting in as many as 
35 to 45 or 50 a week when we had a lot of independent labels that were active. But now uh, the economics have dictated a, a cutback. About how many do you get a week? I think now we're getting about uh, 20 to 35 on a heavy week. So mm -hmm. we listen. Does that include the major labels too? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. oh yeah. We have um, a lot fewer uh, independent labels coming through now. I just don't think it's feasible for them to put out product. It's so expensive. Mm -hmm. And I think they're beginning to realize that you just don't put out a record and then drive around to radio stations like Loretta did in Coal Miner's Daughter mm -hmm. and succeed. I think that they've begun to understand that there is a lot more involved with promoting a record than just making it. So you work Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and you take off Thursday and Friday? Uh, I wish. No. Uh, on Thursday, well, Wednesday afternoon and Thursday, after, or Thursday all day, that's mm -hmm. the time we have to file for up front the music sections. Any stories we have that belong up front uh, are filed that day. Friday's the day I try to set up more interviews to start and get a, a head start on Monday. Mm -hmm. you, s you mentioned record reviews. How do you decide which records to review and which ones not to review? A pick in Billboard is a record that we think will come on the chart and will be a, a major record somewhere between 30 and number one. A recommend is a record that we like very much, uh, that we think has a potential has a potential of coming on the chart between 130. Or it may be a record that's an unknown, but it's really neat, and we want people to, mm -hmm. to listen to it. Uh, then we have the also receives, which are records that are not competitive or not uh, of the quality necessary to go on the chart, so we just don't think they're going to chart. How do you make that decision? Is it a, is it a team, a group, or do you make yeah, it? Yeah, it's uh, my staff, mm -hmm. and uh, we sit down, we listen to each record. Now, not all the records get listened to all the way through. Sometimes you can tell in five or ten seconds that mm -hmm. this is, you know, made in a barn, and it's not going to get airplay uh, in, in any serious way, mm -hmm. so you can throw those out the window. Records that come in on major labels by major acts are almost automatic picks. Even if Mickey Gilley put out a turkey record, it's going to do very well mm -hmm. because Mickey Gilley is established at country music. People like him. They will ride with him on a couple of records if they're not mm -hmm. great. Uh, the marginal ones are the ones we try to be careful with. I would much rather go out on a limb and recommend a record that you know, is an unknown but is really good. You know, they put mm -hmm. a lot of work into it, and it, it could, if it got airplay, be a record. Now, as, as part of the industry, do you see part of your job as exposing new acts? Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And, and what do you do to, to, to that's, do that's that? The, that record is probably reviews? my priority. Well, record reviews, the column is a good way to uh, help expose mm -hmm. new acts. You know, if they come through town and I can meet them, or if a record company signs a new act that doesn't have much of a track record or nobody's heard of them, I can write about them in my column, and programmers will read it and go, Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Well, maybe I will play the record. I didn't know they used to tour with uh, Barbara Mandrell, mm -hmm. or I didn't know that's Janie Fricky's backup singer. That's interesting. Maybe I'll give their record a chance. Have you seen Have you seen results of Yes. Of, of that? Give me some examples. Well, in the case of Exile, mm -hmm. they came in with a major negative. Mm -hmm. They had been a rock and roll band. They had had a, a, a number one single called "Kiss You All Over" uh, back around '78, and then nothing. And they decided they wanted to go into country music. They took a couple of years off. They went back to Kentucky and regrouped and formed an excellent band. And they came to Nashville and started working with Buddy Killen. And they put out their record. And it was very country. And they were really committed. And programmers were going, uh-huh, another reject from pop music trying to make it in country. And they're very sensitive to mm -hmm. that. So I started writing about them. I'd throw in mentions here and there about how they had done it in-store, how they had been on the road with Lee Greenwood, and mm -hmm. I'd, I'd run a picture of them, and trying to show the programmers, trying to show the industry that Exile was serious, and it definitely helped. Definitely helped. They've had four number ones in a row. Okay, you mentioned superstars who generally always get picked. How could you help a superstar? Isn't that very hard? Yeah, very I hard. Mean, so why would you even why would you even fool with them? Well, I, I pass on the information. If Crystal Gale is doing an interesting tour, I pass mm -hmm. it on so programmers can use it when they talk about records on the air or, you know, people in the industry will know who's doing what and what kind of activity is going on. But my specialty or my, my favorite thing is uh, trying to help new acts mm -hmm. and expose new talent. It's very important. Is this a good place for somebody to get started? I think so. I do think so. Mm -hmm. The club scene is not tremendous here, but you've got all six major labels represented here. Uh, it's a good place for people to get started unless they're heavy metal, uh, punk, new wave, uh, Latin, mm -hmm. you know, but within the, within the context of uh, Nashville or country music, it's a very good place because you how can get in to the, see anybody. How about the trades? Is, isn't that a good place for people to start or is that a bad place? You mean start in the music industry? In the music industry. 
I think it's a very good place because you get a tremendous overview. I often feel like I'm the hub of a wheel and I, I get to look out all the record companies, all the publishing companies, all everything that goes on, you're in the middle and it's all going on around you. And I think that it would be very difficult at this point to go to work for one record mm -hmm. company or one booking agency because I think I would feel very isolated. But being at the hub like that, don't you, isn't there the danger of making enemies somewhere along the line? Gee, I never thought about that, Don. <laughs> sure. Maybe you have a lot of them? Or? Well, I try to <clears throat> emphasize integrity. Um, I am opinionated, and I'm not afraid to say things in print that make people think. Mm -hmm. I don't care if they agree or disagree with what I say. I only want them to examine their own ideas and feelings and concepts. And I try to be very fair and very open and very honest. And if someone disagrees with me and they write in and say, I totally take umbrage at your last column, and here's why, a lot of times I'll print that. Mm -hmm. You know, I love dialogues. I love to get people talking. I love to stir up dialogues that, that may uh, result in something positive happening. Mm -hmm. As far as enemies, well, some people don't like to hear anything but what they want to hear. And if that's so, then certainly I suppose I have them. What, what, what's the toughest part of your job? What's, what's the hardest thing you have to do each week? Dealing with the political pressure. Explain that. Well, it's hard being honest. It's hard going out and, and, and putting yourself on the line week after week in articles where you may be reflecting uh, opinions that are not popular. The story I did where I talked about the uh, record album sales, uh, I mean, yes, it, it was a very rough week for me because the record companies hated the fact that I had managed to get a hold of their sales figures. They do not like these things in print. They were furious that Billboard had exposed their, quote, dirty laundry, whereas we see it as reporting the truth. And again, we turned it into a positive mm -hmm. series. Uh, it's, it's being in a hot seat where people think they can call you up if they don't like something you've written and scream at you and you know, cuss at you in some cases. Um, you get threatened? No, no, I never have been threatened. I'm, I don't mean threatened in your life. I mean, well, oh. you're going to lose that job if you Oh, know, yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll get your job for oh, that. Oh, absolutely, yes. Uh, but I figure if I'm doing a good job, and if I'm accurate, and if I'm open and fair, and if I don't let personal bias ever influence what I do, mm -hmm. uh, then I believe that I'm doing the best job I can. Mm -hmm. Is this very lucrative? Do the trades pay you millions of dollars to, <laughs> to, to put up with all of this pressure? Yeah. No. Wade through all this crap? No. No, I don't think uh, writers ever get paid particularly well unless mm -hmm. they're Jacqueline Suzanne or Stephen King. Um, no, trades are not particularly lucrative. But there's so many fringe benefits or perks, as they're uh, called, payola? that come along. Uh, no, not payola. <laughs> no, I've, I've never, uh, I've never had uh, anybody offer me payola. Uh -huh. I have been flown to see concerts when people wanted me to see their acts. Mm -hmm. or well, if I were doing don't, it. Some people consider that payola. Well, if and I'm Christmas doing Christmas gifts and things like that. Yeah, well, there are not very many of them anymore. But uh -huh. I don't let it influence what I do. If someone calls me up from a label and says, "We want you to come and see the Kenny and Dolly concert in Louisville, and we'd like you to do a talent review," I tell them up front, "If I come, I'll do a talent review based on what I see." And it may be good and it may be a negative review depending on what happens on stage. If someone flies me to a showcase to see a new act and they expect that that means I'm going to write about the new act for three weeks after that, I, t I make sure they understand that I will not let what is done for me in that context influence how I deal with it in print. I, I always want to see new talent. I want to see concerts. I want to be involved in what companies mm -hmm. are doing. And if it means taking a trip with them to, you know, to see some of it, fine. It's how you use that information that's important. And I will never compromise the integrity of my magazine or what I do uh, for a trip or a perk. Okay. Well, thank you for being with us today. Uh, that's Kip Kirby with Billboard Magazine, and this is Don Cusick with the Music Biz. Mm -hmm.